Go ahead and get started on uh, chapter four. I think there'll be one more section of this chapter that covers like the nervous system and like uh, GI stuff. Pretty pretty easy stuff. Well, I mean, not as hard as this. This is a hard chapter, okay? It's probably going to be one of the hardest ones. So we're talking about the cardiovascular system and, you know, this or this, it's also called the circulatory system because blood circulates and that's where the name comes from. But um, it's a complex arrangement of tubes connected to one another into a pump, okay? And for the firefighters in the room, you might think that a fire truck could be, the, the engine itself could be the pump and the hoses could be the tubes that are connected. So, you know, sometimes I'll reference the cardiovascular system as like a fire truck because there, there's a little relevance in that. If you can think of the heart as a pump sometimes, I think you can help visualize some things. It's, it's not, you know, really at its core, it's a pretty simple design, but then when we start talking about the intricacies and the details of it, it becomes a little more difficult. But anyways, the system's closed, big shock, but um, um, the systemic circulation in the body and pulmonary circulation in the lung, is, it, all, it all ties together, okay? So the cardiovascular system does involve all those capillary and arteries and veins that work with the lungs as well, okay? So there's, um, let me start with this. There's a lot of uh, stuff on the YouTube out there in the world to help you be able to trace a drop of blood through the heart. It's common. You got to know it, okay? You actually have to be able to trace a drop of blood through the heart. And here's how I will test this, is I will say, trace a drop of blood from the left ventricle back to the left ventricle. I'm not always going to ask you, trace a drop of blood from a cell back to the cell. I might say, trace a drop of blood from the pulmonary artery back to the pulmonary artery. I need you to know it that well. It's that important, okay? It's not even me being fancy. You actually got to be able to trace a drop of blood through the heart and all the way down to the little cells and all the way back. Like, so it's very important, you know, that we know this. So, uh, make this a priority to study this. Uh, it's very high yield. So we'll just start, eh, we'll start here. Okay. Start at the lower body. Okay. Let's just say it's your gastrocnemius, also known as your calf muscle. Okay. And you did a bunch of calf rises at the gym today because who doesn't want bigger calves? I do. So. Here's how this works. The cells themselves will produce CO2, right? And they will need to pick up oxygen. That happens at the capillary beds within the muscle tissue. Okay, we talked about that in the previous lecture. Well, vein it now, once this blood drops off its oxygen, it turns, it literally turns from a reddish color to like a bluish dark purple color. Okay. You've seen this at the doctor's office when they draw blood. So what happens is It'll pick up that um, CO2 and drop off its oxygen, simple diffusion, we know this, and it'll carry it back to the heart. So this is venous blood, okay? A few things we got to know about venous blood. Venous blood is low pressure, okay? So it's not moving very hard or fast, okay? So it's low pressure. Um, venous blood really is purplish or bluish um, color in real life because it is deoxygenated. Um, venous blood has maybe a slightly lower glucose amount because it's dropped off some glucose at the cells. Um, and venous blood goes to the right side of the heart. Okay. Um, so here's how this works. This venous blood goes from the cell. I'm going to use my laser for this one. And it goes through this thing called the inferior vena cava. Okay. It literally means, uh, like inferior because it's below the heart inferior because this came from my gastrocnemius, my cow. And it's, um, the vena cava, like it means big vein. Okay. Big vein. And so what happens is it goes up and it goes to the right atrium. Okay. So the heart is really divided into four. Let's see if there's a picture here. Uh, not a great picture. We're going to use this one. The heart's divided into, into four. There's two chambers up top and two bigger chambers down bottom. Okay. The ones on top are called the atrium or the atria, okay? So what happens is, atria is plural. So what happens is we go through the inferior vena cava to the right atrium, okay? So blood dumps there from the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. So if you were to take the same deoxygenated blood from someone's brain or mouth, it comes through the inferior vena cava through their neck, um, and it dumps into the right atrium, okay? So this deoxygenated blood in the right atrium is sitting in this pocket basically in this, this, this area, this chamber. And so what happens is the right atrium needs to squeeze a little, but not very hard because all it has to do is pump blood from the right atrium 
to the right ventricle. The ventricle is the bottom part of the heart. How do I, why, what helps me remember it's a ventricle is this puppy right here. It's shaped like a V. Booyah. Okay, it's shaped like a V. It's the right ventricle. Okay, now, so it goes from right atrium. It goes through a little valve. What valve is that? It's the tricuspid valve. So remember, anytime you go to J.C. Penney's or Kohl's or Ross and get harassed by the uh, protection people, the shoplifting people that think you're stealing everything and you're not, um, you uh, you have to try it before you buy it, right? So try it before you buy. So you, I want you to know, tricuspid. And then the next one is the bicuspid. Okay. The other word for the uh, bicuspid valve is the mitral valve. Okay. It's annoying. There's two names for the same thing. So try before you buy. So again, right atrium, try before you buy the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, now your heart has to pump this deoxygenated blood away from the heart to the lungs. So anytime... Blood is traveling away from the heart. It goes in an artery. Arteries always go away from the heart. Rhymes, doesn't it? Arteries with an A go away from the heart. So what happens is the right ventricle has to pump it through the pulmonic artery because it's pumping it away from the heart to the lungs. Now, why this is weird is it's still deoxygenated blood. When we think arteries, we typically think oxygenated blood. Not in this case. It's the exception. And what do examiners like to go after? The exception. So it is the pulmonary artery has deoxygenated blood. Okay? So, again, recapitulate. Right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle. This is called the pulmonic semilunar valve to the pulmonic artery. Okay? There is a little valve right before you go into... Uh, the pulmonic artery. The pulmonic artery pumps blood to the lungs, okay? And diffusion takes place. We've talked about this over and over again. Diffusion takes place, okay? We know that part. Then it has to, through pressure, has to pump its way back to the left atrium now, okay? So now the blood is oxygenated, so it's red. So pay attention to this. See how it's red here? It pumps its way back through the pulmonic vein. And again, this is an exception. When we think veins, we typically think deoxygenated blood. Not in this case. It is oxygenated. So this is the pulmonic vein is bringing oxygen-rich oxygen -rich blood to the heart, okay? So it's pumping it through, from the lungs to the, uh, through the pulmonic vein into the left atrium, okay? Again, the left atrium sits on top of the heart, just on the left side. And then it has to dump its way through the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve, potato, potato, pick one, I don't care, no one cares. I recommend bicuspid, although it's because it's easier, but you do you. So it goes through the left atrium, through the mitral or bicuspid valve, into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, now it has to pump really, really hard, really, really far. Because uh, in the right ventricle, all it had to do was pump to the lungs. It's not a very far field trip to go from your heart to your lungs. It's very close. But now on the left side, it's got to pump blood all the way from your little left ventricle all the way up to the top of your head and all the way to the bottom of your little big toe. Like it's got to pump really far. So in order to do that, it has to pump harder. And, the re and, and we know it pumps harder. So you can notice the size difference of the ventricles. The left ventricle is thicker because it has to pump further has to pump harder, has to pump up to your head, down to your toe. It's a really long way for blood to travel. In comparison to right ventricle, really thin. It doesn't have to pump very far, okay? And that is a normal, and then and then it pumps out of the left ventricle, okay? Oxygen to blood out of the left ventricle into the aorta. So let me say it all again. You might want to make this your ringtone, okay? If someone calls you, they hear me saying this, right? So we, stells, diffusion happens. Oxygen's dropped off, CO2's picked up. It goes through venous blood through the inferior or superior vena cava. It goes, so this way, right? It goes into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it goes into the pulmonic artery. It is deoxygenated blood in the pulmonic artery. And then it goes to the lungs from, for diffusion. After it does diffusion in the lungs, it comes back to the heart through the pulmonic vein. The pulmonic vein is oxygenated. And then from the pulmonic vein, it dumps into the left atrium. From the left atrium, it goes through the mitral or bicuspid valve 
I don't care. Pick one. And then it goes into the left ventricle. The left ventricle is thick because it has to pump blood all the way up to your head and down to your toe. And then it goes through to your aorta. Okay. What's the aorta? Um, they don't have it illustrated on here. It's a really big artery. Okay. And it comes off your heart and it kind of curves off and a bunch of stuff branches off. That's a drop of blood through the heart. There's tons of videos, raps, rhymes, sayings, catchphrases, movies, cartoons on how to know that. You have to know that. Have to know that. Okay. Now, the heart is a muscular organ. Okay. It's made up of skeletal or uh, cardiac muscle, very similar to car, uh, skeletal muscle, but it's different. It's striated, involuntary muscle, cardiac muscle. Okay. Um, the heart muscle itself is called the myocardium. Okay. Um, I'll show you that later. Uh, blood enters the right atrium via the superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus. So it, again, if, if blood's coming from my head, it's the inferior vena cava. If blood's coming from my gut, it's the inferior vena cava. Okay, intuitive. And blood from the pulmonic vein enters the left atrium. Yeah, okay, cool. So here's simple, this is what, I hate to tell you, hearts don't look like this, right? Like they show in the movies. They look like this, and they're really complicated, but they're really efficient pumps, okay? So this is like a... Uh, a hemisection of the heart, like they've sliced it open for us. So um, it all kind of makes sense. So let me draw a drop of blood through the heart one more time, but I'm not going to add any extra jingles to it. Inferior vena cava, right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, pulmonic artery, pulmonic artery, lungs for diffusion, comes back through the pulmonic veins, left atrium, mitral or bicuspid valve, left ventricle, um, and then it goes out through the uh, our aorta. Okay. That's how that works. Okay. Um, now I'll point out a few things. There's the epi. Epi means outer. Myocardium is the actual muscle itself. Myo means muscle. And endocardium is the inner, inner layer of the heart. Okay. You might occasionally see that. I don't find it crazy high yield, but I've seen it assessed. Okay. Now there's these things called chordae tendinae right here. And these help with the valve function. Sometimes we can get pathology like in rheumatoid heart disease on them, you know, eh. It's kind of worth knowing, I guess, maybe. But um, this is the aorta. Really big, really big artery, okay? And we have the common carotids and the subclavian and all this stuff branching off of it, okay? And it, and it loops around like this and it goes down, okay? So it comes out and it, it makes this loop and it goes out. In fact, fun fact, you can fill this. A lot of paramedics don't know this. Uh, I can't fill it today. Yeah. Push on the top of your sternum, dig in a little bit, you'll feel the tip of your aorta where it curves. Mm -hmm. The more you know. So this is just pretty simple anatomy, okay? I don't have a lot to add on that. There's valves on the heart, okay? Heart valves. Um, so there's valves, okay? Because let me show you why. When this squeezes, you want the blood to go this way. So when, when the ventricle squeezes, you want the blood to go this way. If it regurgitates back into the right atrium, that's not an efficient pump. So these little doors open up in the direction that they want the blood to go. Okay. So as you can see, blood's easily able to go through those doors. They opened up, but they can't go this way because the doors aren't opened. Okay. So depending on where the pressure is. So this squeezes, blood comes through. Pause, pause, pause. This squeezes, blood goes through. So that's, that's where you get the lub dub. It's these different valves closing. The whole heart doesn't just bam, bam, squeeze all at the same time. That's not an efficient pump. It's not what's happening. Okay. Um, so we have two AV valves, and these are going to be your um, mitral and uh, tricuspid valves. So the atrioventricular valves, so atrium, the top of the heart, the ventricle, the bottom of the heart, they're valves that separate the top and the bottom of the heart. So that's your mitral or bicuspid valve and your uh, tricuspid valve, okay? And then we have the aortic and pulmonic valves. These are what's called semilunar valves. So they kind of look like little moons. Um, I'll draw it for you. I'm a terrible guy, artist, but they look like this. So they look like that. There's three of them. There's supposed to be three of them. And so blood psh, goes through it like that, this way. And it opens them up, but blood can't go back in. Psh, psh, like that, okay? Now... Um, blood flow within the heart. Um, I just explained all this. I don't want to say it again because it's confusing. Read it yourself if you want. Now, um, the heart sounds not real high yield. They are extremely high yield in medical school, but mm, 
Like sometimes I, I, even in the clinic, I listen to someone's heart and I'm like, mm, sounds good to me, but I'm not real confident on that because I mean, how am I supposed to, anyways, they're difficult. So heart sounds, um, what, what, what we're hearing is the valves opening and closing and they make a sound. Okay. It's worth knowing. I'm telling you, these aren't high yield, but it is worth knowing this part at least, right? Heart sounds or valves opening and closing. Really it's closing. Um, and what happens is an S1 S stands for sound. S1 sound one is the lub dub, lub dub. So the lub that you're hearing is closure of the AV valves, right? The tricuspid and mitral valves, okay? So that's what you're hearing. And S2 is the pulmonic and aortic valves, okay? I mean, this isn't like crazy high yield for EMT school. It might be a little more high yield for uh, paramedic school. It's certainly high yield for medical school, maybe nursing school. But it's worth knowing at least this. There's a lot, 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 lot more to heart sounds than that. This is very basic, okay? So do know at least what's on this slide, okay? Now, we have this electrical con conduction system of the heart that becomes very important in paramedic school, and to a degree, we still need to know about it in EMT school. So um, the brain controls the heart rate and strength through a variety of ways, through chemoreceptors and baroreceptors, and a lot of different things work together that will influence heart rate. I'm not talking about that. But um, that's what controls like rate, okay? But the contractions themselves are actually initiated within the heart at these little areas I'm about to show you on the next slide. And they're here, okay? So you actually need to know this part as well. It's not me being fancy. All conduction... And in, this is normal physiology, no pathology here. Normally, what should happen is it should start up in the right atrium at this thing called the SA node. What's the SA node stand for? Sinoatrial node. It can also be called the sinus node. That is the primary pacemaker of the heart. Boom, test question. What is the primary pacemaker of the heart? It is the SA node, also known as the sinus node. It's coming, okay? It's the SA node. Okay, so we start up here in the right atrium. Let me delete my, at the right atrium. And it travels down through um, these internodal bundles that have fancy names. And it goes down to this guy called the AV node. Remember the AV valves, the atrioventricular valves, the tricuspid mitral valve? The AV node is in between the atrium and the ventricles. So it's the AV node. It's also called the junction. I'll write that down here. Why is it the junction? It's because the junction between the top and the bottom of the heart. So what happens is at this AV valve, or I'm sorry, AV node, is it holds the conduction. So the SA node says fire. The SA node uh, fires. It goes across the, le uh, the left and right atrium. They squeeze, do their job. Great. And then it sends the signal down to the AV node. AV node says, gotcha. But I'm going to hold on a minute. And it holds on for just a millisecond or two. And then it'll say fire and it'll send it down. The reason it holds it is because when this left uh, or right atrium is emptying, you have to let all the blood get out of here and into the left ventricle before it fires. Because if the whole heart as one muscle just went bam, bam, and fired all at the same time, terribly efficient pumping. You don't want that. So the AV node holds the conduction for just a second. Hold, like on Braveheart, hold, and then it'll send it down even further, okay? So let's recapitulate. SA node depolarizes and sends it to the left and right atrium, and then it goes down to the AV node. AV node says, gotcha, but I'm going to wait a second. Not an actual second, but it's milliseconds. And then it'll fire, and as it fires down, it goes down these things called the bundle of his. Yes, his, okay? I don't know why they call it that, but it's the bundle of his. That's these things, okay? So it's through the septum of the of the left and right ventricle. And so it goes down, and then it kind of like, that's like the highway. And then there's like these little dirt roads it's got to go down to get to every little uh, last muscle cell within the heart. So then it goes to the left and right bundle branches, okay? So AV node, whoops, AV node, bundle of his, left and right bundle branches. And then you go down the driveway to get to your nice ranch estate. Boom! It goes even further through the Bakunji fibers. So let me start from the beginning again with no commentary. Whoops. SA node, right atrium, depolarizes the left and right atrium. And then it'll travel to the AV node, which is at the atrioventricular junction. It holds it for a few milliseconds, and then it'll send it down the bundle of his. 
to the left and right bundle branch, then to the Perkunji fibers, and it does it over and over again, a hundred times a minute, you know, or however fast your heart's beating. Okay, and if it fails, we die. So that's it. Got to know the cardiac conduction system. Okay. Now, maybe not crazy high yield, but I'll tell you. So we have these things called the chronotropic, dermotropic, inotropic states, okay? And this is through the autonomic, like the um, automatic part of our nervous system that we don't think of. You can't change your heart rate just by thinking, you know, directly thinking, oh, change my heart rate. You can't do that. So there's these things. I, I don't think you're going to get tested on these, but um, called inotropy. So inotropy is the contractility of the heart. And why why are these, why am I even telling you this? A, it's on your slides, but B, there's medicines that we give as paramedics, especially in epinephrine, which EMTs give, affects these things. Okay, so we got to know about them. So epinephrine will increase the contractility, also known as inotropy of the heart. It also will increase the chronotropy. What's chronos mean? It means time. Okay, in Latin or Greek, I don't know. It means time. Okay, so it'll increase the rate of the heart, epinephrine will, and it'll also increase the dromotropy, which is the conduction speed within the heart. So epinephrine increases all three, and we give epinephrine as EMTs, okay? So that's why uh, I'm telling you this. This last thing, this could show up as a one-liner on a quiz, but alpha affects the heart, or I'm sorry, it affects the heart, but it's really through vasoconstriction. So I want you to think alpha vasoconstriction. I'll say it again. Alpha, especially alpha-1, vasoconstriction, alpha-1, vasoconstriction, alpha-1, vasoconstriction, know that, okay? Now, beta, which will look like this if you ever see this on an exam, looks like that. It's, it's like a bee with a little longer tail. Um, will increase the uh, inotropic, dromotropic, chronotropic states uh, as well, but where beta becomes really helpful, especially beta-2, is albuterol, and EMTs give albuterol. So we can change someone's inotropic, dronotropic, chronotropic states of their heart by giving albuterol. So that's why the relevance of us knowing these things, okay? Um, so the cardiac cycle, yeah, so let's talk about this. Have you ever heard of blood pressure? Okay. Well, what's the normal blood pressure, Hunter? Good question. It's 120 over 80. The top number is your systolic and your bottom number is your diastolic. So let's talk about each of these numbers. So systole is the contraction of the ventricles. And this is when your left ventricle, it's really measuring your left ventricle exclusively, is pumping blood all the way up to your head and down to your big toe. So it's high pressure. It's going to be the big number of systole. Okay. And in this case, we measure this in something weird called millimeters of mercury. Okay. So it's 120 millimeters of mercury. Whoever came with that, don't know. That's number, that's the measurement they came up with. So the systole is the top number, and it's when the heart contracts. And it's intuitive when a heart, when the muscle contracts, the pressure is going to be high. So that's why it's the top number. As opposed to diastole is the bottom number, and it's when it relaxes. And in dia diastole, the ventricles are feeling, but there's still pressure within the system. It's never zero. Well, if you're alive, it's never zero. So diastole is relaxation. So test question. Which phase is um, cardiac contraction occurring in? So diastole, systole, whatever. It, cardiac contraction takes place in syst or, uh, systole. Okay, it's the top number. Which number should be higher, systole or diastole? It's always going to be systole. Always. Okay. Um, so the the top number goes on top, so, or the high number goes on top. Sorry. Um, and then there's this thing called pulse pressure. What's pulse pressure? Real simple. It's it's the systole minus diastole. So in this case, I would just take 120 minus 80, and that equals 40 if my calculations are correct. And that's your pulse pressure. Okay, easy. The, it's, the, it's the amount of pressure between the top number and bottom number. Pulse pressure. This becomes relevant in like Beck's triad and um, uh, 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 tension pneumothorax and pericardial tamponade. We're going to talk about that. But it, it has some clinical relevance. That's why I'm telling you. Okay, now... This is annoying, but it's easy. There's this thing called afterload, okay? So what's afterload? Let me start with what, which they didn't cover. Let me tell you what preload is. This is like actually relevant. Preload. Preload is what's coming into the heart. So preload really can equal what's in your inferior vena cava or your vena cava or in your superior vena cava, right? So what's coming into the heart? So what? how could we influence preload? Oh, how much blood is in the system? 
Can I increase the amount of blood in the system by adding IV fluids? I can. Yeah, you can. So you could have a nitroglycerin, an EMT drug, right? Causes venodilation. So you have that vena cava open up. So that's one way you can decrease preload is with nitroglycerin. It's an EMT drug. We'll talk about that in pharmacology. But that's preload. Preload is the amount of blood into the chambers of the heart prior to contraction. So how much can we preload into the heart before it contracts? That's the question of preload. And we can influence that in medicine in a variety of different ways. And then afterload is how much pressure does the left ventricle have to pump out, like pump against to get blood out of the left ventricle into the aorta? How much is that? So what's the after load that it has to pump against? So preload, loaded, pumping, after load, I'm pumping, pumping, pumping. How much pressure does it take to get out? That's after load. Okay. And again, we can influence this in medicine, nitroglycerin, uh, calcium channel blockers, nephetapine, you know, like all these dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, we can influence blood pressure, um, and which influences afterload and preload. But just know there's medicines that influence this. This is why I'm telling you this. Okay. Then we have stroke volume. This is the amount of blood and it's intuitive stroke one stroke. What's the volume? It's stroke volume. It's how much you're pumping out. Stroke volume, okay? And then cardiac output, simple formula. It's, you got to know this, stroke volume times heart rate. Oops. Cardiac output. Know that. Get a tattoo of it. I don't know. Know it, okay? Name your kid it. So stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output, okay? Moving forward, um, the cardiac cycle. So... There's this law called Frank Starling's law, and what it says is um, – here's what it really says. It says that the more that the cardiac myocytes, those little muscles, the skeletal muscles, stretch, the greater they will contract. And I like to think of it like a rubber band almost. Like the more you stretch a rubber band and pow, let go, the greater it contracts. So the same thing happens in our heart, and they named it after this cool dude – called Frank Starling. And so it's called Starling's Law. Shout out Starling. So what happens is the more venous blood we have in our heart, the greater the stretch of the cardiac myocyte, the greater the contraction. And the reason this becomes relevant is, in, again, nitroglycerin, an EMT basic drug, to where if you decrease preload, I, just take my word, nitroglycerin, an EMT drug that we give in chest pain, decreases preload. So when we decrease preload, then we can have um, uh, less stretch because remember preload is loading it up before we load and after load. So we're loading it up. So if this is normal, right, and we gave nitroglycerin, so we decrease the preload so it's only stretched out this far, it doesn't take much to contract, okay? Less oxygen. What happens in a heart attack? We don't have enough oxygen. So it's this therapeutic treatment with, with nitroglycerin. So again, let me recapitulate. Frank Starling's Law states that – the more blood into the heart through preload, the greater the myocardial stretch, the greater the myocardial contractility. That's the rules. Okay. Moving forward. What's ejection fraction? Ejection fraction says, how much blood are you actually ejecting out of the, out of the left ventricle? And so we could draw the left ventricle here. Okay. This is the left ventricle. And Whoops, my hand ring's terrible today. I apologize. Um, worse than normal. So what's happening is this puppy fills up with blood, okay? And when the heart contracts, not quite like my um, uh, animations, it doesn't fully like, like squeeze down, okay? What does happen is it kind of leaves a little bit in there, and that's normal. So the normal ejection fraction is more than 70. So we should be pumping out of our left ventricle about 70% of the blood that's in there. Anything less than that, like say you're only pumping out half the blood, you'd have a 50% ejection fraction. That's path, really anything less than 70, that's pathological. You see this in heart failure, uh, people that have had heart attacks. So that's ejection fraction. Preload, I just explained this several times. Now, um, blood is transported through the body in a series of arteries and veins, yada, yada, yada. We know that, okay? But arteries branch into smaller arterioles. And then they divide even further into capillaries. So let's recapitulate. Arteries, arterioles, 
capillaries. In that order, you got to know it. Arteries, arterioles, capillaries. Okay? So, let's look at this. This is an artery because they drew it red. How nice. But here's what happens with these. Let me do this in green. Arteries are actually really rigid. Okay? Um, how do I know this? You could, you could see this on yourself. You can feel your crowd of pulse and jam down on that. Well, not your crowd. That's not a great example. But your radial pulse, it's got some some oomph to it. it feels like a pipe-ish almost, like an like a thick water hose. Compared to veins, these are like the great value water hoses. They collapse really easily, and I'll I'll come back to that. But you need to know arteries are rigid because they have muscle. What muscle is it? It's smooth muscle. So our Arteries have smooth muscle in them in this weird later layer called the tunica media Here tunica media um, It means like tunica the middle layer and, and in the middle layers the is the muscle It's smooth muscle and do we have control over smooth muscle? No, we don't so we can't control this like not consciously it, it, it's autonomic so what happens is um, the 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 muscles will contract the smooth muscles will contract to increase the pressure or to dilate, and there's medicines that influence that. That's not important. So I want you to know this. Arteries are a lot more rigid. They're like the craftsman water hose of the vascular system. And um, they go arteries, branch off to art arterioles, into the capillary beds. They carry, um, for the most part, oxygenated. They carry blood away from the heart, but for the most part, it's oxygenated, okay? What's the exception? The pulmonic artery, it's not oxygenated blood, okay? But for the most part, it's oxygenated blood, okay? And we'll talk about where you can fill arteries and stuff like that at pulse points, okay? Got that. Now, moving forward, we're going to the venous side of the house. So what are veins, right? Well, you can see them all over my arm and on your arm and stuff. These are carrying blood away from your cells back to the right side of your heart. But remember me saying at the beginning of this lecture, they're low pressure. And the fact that they're low pressure they are not rigid, okay? So you could demonstrate this on yourself if you're not obese. You could like push down on your vein and it collapses, okay? The same thing can happen to your vena cava. There's pathology where we end up compressing our vena cava like pregnant people um, and it collapses. So veins are a lot more um, soft. They have far less muscle in them. They're a lot less rigid. These are the Dollar Tree water hoses. They're very thin, okay? They, they collapse by design. And here's the thing about veins. They're so low pressure, we have to have these things called valves inside our veins. And, um, I don't see, there's one. You kind of see, like, in your, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see right there how, um, there's, like, a jut up on my, um, on my, my vein? That's a valve. And so, the, since, it, since it is a low pressure system, the blood kind of moves forward, but these valves go to where they can't let blood go back. So, you know, in, in this example on myself, blood starts from my fingers and it goes through this valve, but now it can't go backwards. It can, it can only go this way and it'll need another valve and it'll go this way, but it can't go back. So that's by design that God gave us valves. In the venous system, we have valves. And this becomes a real pain in the ass when you're starting IVs because if you stick a needle through a valve, you rupture, you risk rupturing their, their vein, and then you got to restart. It doesn't work. So valves are like your arch nemesis when you start drawing blood and doing IVs. They're really annoying. Um, so anyways, that's the different stuff. Uh, tunica intima is the inner layer. Intima, inner, okay? Tunica media, medial, it's the medial layer, the middle layer, and it's muscle. So three M's there, medial muscle, uh, media. And then the adventitia, you see this a lot in medicine. Tunica adventitia is the outermost layer, okay? It's really the connective tissue, but it's the outermost layer, okay? Now, moving forward, um, the, the, the circulation of the heart. So the heart is supplied via these things called coronary arteries. You might have heard grandma or grandpa talk about having coronary artery disease, okay? Well, the thing is, the heart, um, here they are, um, the heart has these arteries, because the heart itself is a muscle, yeah, and it beats 100 times a minute or 60 to 100 times a minute all day for the, our entire life, and so it requires a lot of oxygen and blood flow and glucose and all the things it needs to do those little cells to do their job. So it's supplied through a special set of arteries called the coronary arteries, and they supply the myocardium with oxygen. So there's all these different patterns and stuff that I 
absolutely don't think you need to memorize. But just know the heart has coronary arteries. And one thing I do want you to know is the heart um, the heart myocardium gets its oxygen in diastole. What's diastole? It's when the heart's relaxing. It's when it's the ventricles are filling. So when the ventricles are filling, the heart muscle is going, whew, sucking in some good old blood. And then boom, when it squeezes again, it squeezes down to where it can't suck it in. So that is uh, coronary arteries. They supply the myocardium oxygen. It happens to take place during diastole. Okay. You know, there's all these different branches. I think it's bullshit. I need to stop. It's, it's garbage. You don't need to know about all that stuff. Okay, not at the EMT level, maybe at the paramedic level, but no, I'm not, I'm not trying to baffle y'all with nonsense, you know, you don't need to know that. Like, you don't need to name them is what I'm saying, or point them out on a model. Um, all right, pulmonic circulation, we've talked about this. So, pulmonic lungs, we're carrying blood from the right side of the heart, it's got to take a little bitty field trip from the right side of the heart to the lungs, they're like right here. So, um, it does, the right ventricle is not very thick and it doesn't pump very with a high amount of pressure because it doesn't have to travel very far. So it carries deoxygenated blood through the pulmonic artery because it's going away from the heart, even though it's deoxygenated through the pulmonic valve into, uh, the lungs. Okay. And, um, that's where diffusion takes place. That's pulmonic circulation. There's a lot of pathology that happens here, but we'll talk about that later. So the vascular system, systemic arterial circulation, right? So um, this is like the whole system of arteries, okay? Systemic, arterial, circulation, right? It's, it's like, so again, I'm just such a big fan of students and myself. If I don't, like, why? Wow, that sounds sophisticated. Systemic arterial circulation, it's not. Just break down the words. You can do it. Don't just throw your hands in the air and be like, oh, I don't know what that is. Don't do that. Just break down the words. Use your phonics. We can get through this. Context clues. All right. So there's, um. remember me drawing the heart, and there's this thing called the aorta, pacha, that pulls off the left ventricle, and there's branches, pew, 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 that branch out to like the subclavian and the head and the carotids and all these places. Um, so that's what they're talking about, and where these branch off is at the aortic arch. Well, we dipped it arches, so that's where they tend to branch off. And I drew four; it's really just three, but you get the picture, okay? Now this is just sewing; it's a system; it's a closed loop system. So it all is floating around, okay? It's one big system. I mean, I don't have much to add to that. I'm sorry. Uh, I will say, no, nah, oh yeah, we start IVs here. It's called your antecubital fascia. Antecubital, okay? Um, we start a lot of IVs on the back of the hands and the AC right there. You can also start them in the neck or in the feet, really. You can start them anywhere, but you got to point the needle towards the heart. Um, all right, so we have the brachiocephalic artery and the common carotid arteries. So um, you can feel your the, the carotid artery, right? So find it. No, it's not weird. Just find it. Right? It's right there. Um, you'd be amazed about the amount of healthcare professionals that cannot find pulses. It's, it's, it's horrendous. You should be really good at finding those. So why should you be good at finding those? Because when someone's dead, um, it's really hard to find them when you're trying to determine, am I doing CPR or not? Really difficult, so be good at finding these. So, anyways, they're right there. The few things I'll point out: there's your um, cricothyroid cartilage, right? And there's your thyroid. You know that, that has a lot to do with your endocrinology. Um, we have these carotid sinuses. These kind of measure stretch, and based on how um, um, little they stretch, determines how much of your sympathetic nervous system kicks on. So it's kind of weird how they work, um, but that's kind of probably a little more advanced. I don't know if you need to know that. All right, upper extremity. So it comes off of the subclavian, off the aortic arch, mm -hmm, and it goes down through um, like your, your shoulder and your collarbone. So we have a major artery um, here. Yeah, here. Oh, I can feel it easily. So uh, what I want you to do, do this, is take your bicep and your tricep and separate the two. It's kind of uncomfortable. And push towards your humerus, the long bone in your arm, and you should feel a pulse. That's called your brachial pulse. You need to know how to find that. What We use this on children. We use this all the time on children. Okay? Break your artery. We assess this on children. Um, and then the radial pulse. Remember, that's your thumb side. Remember, we feel pulses with our fingers, never our thumbs. Our thumbs, right? But it's on the patient's thumb side. Okay? You should be able to feel that. Ulnar pulse. 
I didn't even know that. I mean, no, you don't assess that. So I need you to know radial, brachial, pulse for now. That's what you need to know. And carotid. Okay. The thoracic aorta. Um, yeah. The, the aorta, you know, like I said, this is the heart. It loops down. Okay. And right in here is your, thora your thorax. So yeah, there's branches here. Okay. Now, the abdominal aorta, we get a lot of pathology with this. So buckle up. What happens is, you know, here's, a, here's your diaphragm first, right? The muscle for breathing. Um, it goes down through here and through the diaphragm, right? And it branches off at the celiac plexus right here, okay? Or the celiac trunk. And the celiac trunk supplies the liver and the, the, the foregut, like the top portion of your guts uh, and your spleen and all sorts of stuff, okay? Um, so that's one area. And then it'll go further down and it'll branch off again. And then it'll go further down, and it, it branches off to your kidneys. And then it'll go further down, and it bifurcates. What does bifurcate mean? It means to split, okay, like this. Well, like this. Here, you know, to split. So what happens is it bifurcates into the iliacs. And I told you in our previous video, you can feel your femoral pulse pretty easily, and it's a good place to feel for a pulse in cardiac arrest. So feel your femoral pulse. That's your next assignment. Find your femoral pulse. Not in class, not in, like, the library or something weird. But find your femoral pulse. It's easy. Um, and once you do it a few times, you'll be able to like, boom, you're going to be like, -cha! like you'll just snipe it. You'll know where to go. Okay. It's very easy to find. It's in the fold of your groin. Okay. Just feel around until you find it. Um, so, um, that's the abdominal aorta. The reason this becomes a little relevant clinically, like, um, pathologically is sometimes we can get what's called an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Aneurysm is ballooning of a vessel to where this, instead of being like a water hose, it's nice and straight it balloons, it swells up. Well, what happens to water hoses when they swell up? They rupture. What happens when your aorta ruptures? You die very quickly. So you don't want that. So that's an abdominal aorta, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Sometimes you'll hear it called a triple A. Okay. This is your spleen, or I'm sorry, that's your stomach. Here's your pancreas. This is your spleen. But what they're trying to demonstrate here, you don't need to know the names of all these for sure. You do not need to know the names of all these. Um, they're trying to demonstrate, you know, there's a lot of vasculature in the stomach and the guts. That shouldn't be surprising, okay? Um, I, I will say this. A lot of it comes off the celiac plexus through the superior mesenteric uh, artery, okay? And then you have your inferior mesenteric artery that does, like, the bottom half of your guts, okay? Um, okay, we just, oh, well, here, here's a good picture. This is where your femoral artery is. You need to be able to find it. Okay, it's right there. It's in like that little crease. Okay, now, so, and it goes down. And see, remember when I was telling you in the bone lecture, how like there's stuff that wraps around the, the, uh, the, the long bones especially? This is the example. So like stuff wraps all around it. And, you know, remember when someone breaks their hip, they break it right here. Okay, not their pelvis, their hip. They break it here. And, oh, what in the world? My computer does this sometimes. Stand by. Okay, right here. This is the hip. Remember, people can break that. Okay. Um, now, moving forward, the last one that I well, maybe not the very last, two more, that I want you to feel is the popliteal artery. Yeah, it's behind the knee. What you have to do is straight out your knee and kind of dig, go digging for it. It's not easy to find, okay? If you can't find this, I won't hate on you. But uh, it's the popliteal artery, okay? And then the last one that I really want you to be able to feel, because this happens a lot when we do splinting, we'll cover this in lab, is the dorsalis peus, okay? Sometimes you'll hear people call... The pedal pulse. Yes, I know it's spelled pedal, like a, but it's the pedal pulse, okay? So it's the dorsalis pedis or the pedal pulse, okay? Um, and it's felt like on the top of your foot. Like, if I were to feel it, I would feel it probably right about here. In fact, these are so hard to find when I find them, I mark them with a Sharpie. Like if someone breaks their leg, um, they're, they're real hard to find. So what I'll do is I'll just take a Sharpie and be like, X marks the spot to where I know, and the physician knows, and the nurses know, that's where we last felt the pulse. All right. Um, so venous circulation, that's all arterial. Do we feel pulses with arteries? We do. Now we're moving to venous. Okay, venous is going back to the right side of the heart, and or really the heart in general, but mostly the right side of the heart. And the venous system, low pressure, has valves, and um, deoxygenated blood. And, uh, geez, I'm forgetting something. Okay, moving forward. Um, so, uh, the systemic venous circulation. This is what I need you to know about this. 
it um it, it's deoxygenated and here's the one yeah 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 right here this is the guy this is the one you got to know all the other ones garbage you don't need to know this one you do it's called the hepatic portal vein or the portal vein is really what it's called but it's called the portal vein okay and the portal vein carries all the nutrients and stuff from your guts back to the liver. So it's very important. So it carries blood back to the liver. The portal vein, this guy, right, carries all the venous blood. So everything that you ate, all the medicine you ingested, it carries it back to the liver. Conveniently, the liver will detoxify and process all that blood. But it carries blood back to the liver, the portal vein. This becomes important when we talk about portal hypertension with liver cirrhosis. Excuse me. We'll talk about that later. But that's the portal vein, okay? Um, so, oh, this was going to tell you. You don't feel pulses and veins. You shouldn't, okay? That that was the piece earlier that I was like, what did I forget? That was it, okay? So, uh, moving forward. Now, again, you don't really palpate veins. Not traditionally. You can't feel pulses on them. You can see them. You can feel them. You can palpate them. But uh, you shouldn't feel a pulsation. If you do, it's not a vein, it's an artery. Or it's not an artery. Yeah, if, if you put, feel a pulsation, it's not a vein, it is an artery. Okay? So, you know, again, this antecubital fascia right here is a great place to start an IV. That's where we start a lot of IVs. The dorsum of the hand, start a lot of IVs there. Okay? Great stuff. Um, you're, uh, so as you can see, the external and internal Ill here, we're going back over to leg. Um they, they, they branch together and will form the inferior vena cava, okay? Oh, blood composition. I should have, I should have put a, a, a slide on here of this, but it's okay. Basically, I think the book has this. This is a test tube, okay? Imagine it's a test tube, like from a laboratory. Um, uh, I don't want to draw this out. There's pictures all over the internet. Look up test tube of blood percentages, okay? I want you to know that 55% of it is this watery, uh, straw-colored fluid called plasma. Okay, remember CO2 is carried in the plasma, mostly dissolved in the plasma. So plasma, it's the watery stuff of your blood. You've seen this if you've ever like cut yourself and you see like the little clear stuff on top. That's plasma. Okay, the majority of blood is water. Shouldn't be surprising. The majority or eight percent of blood is dissolved substances like protein, electrolytes, salt, potassium, calcium, chloride, blah 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 blah. Proteins, albumin, you know, bilirubin, stuff like that. Okay, and then forty-five percent of the cells suspended in plasma are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Okay, what do each of these do? Red blood cells carry oxygen. White blood cells fight infection. Okay. And platelets, they do clotting, blood clotting. Okay, got to know that. That's the bare bone minimums of what they do. Red blood cells, oxygen. White blood cells, infection. Platelets, clotting. Have to know that. Oh, um, you think I don't prepare for these? I do, I swear. I just forget about the next slide. So red blood cells carry oxygen. White blood cells, uh, I will say, if someone wants to be tricky, they'll call them leukocytes. So it's leukocytes, it just means white blood cells. White blood cells equals leukocytes, synonymous, okay? And they play a role in allergic response, inflammatory response, infectious response, you know, all that stuff, as you would imagine, okay? Immunity. Uh, and then platelets, these um, these are little like, uh, little thing. they're really not that color, but they uh, they float around in the blood and they they what happens is when you have like a cut or a reason that platelets say, Activate. What happens is they all start clumping up together. They form clots. They all start holding on to each other. And uh, when they hold on to each other, they cause a clot. Okay, so that's platelets. Hmm, good question. What inhibits platelets that EMT basics give? What's a platelet aggregation inhibitor? Aspirin. Aspirin is a platelet aggregation inhibitor. So let's think about this. If this is someone's coronary artery, Okay, blood's supposed to be going this way to the heart. Okay, if this is someone's coronary artery and it's blocked up with this platelet plug right here, what could we give to keep other little platelet boys from sticking to this platelet? We give aspirin. And when we give aspirin, this little platelet's just going to mosey on by. It's not going to stick to the other platelets. That's why we give aspirin in heart attacks. 
In fact, it's the, mm, no, I'm I'm not going to go into that. Now, um, red blood cells do contain the surface antigens. Oh, this is annoying. So have you ever heard someone saying, oh, I'm A blood, AB blood, type O blood? Okay, well, if you're A blood, you, ha you, you, you have the A antigen, right? So you can only, um, oh no, you have anti-B. So, ha so you can only get A type blood. So let me say that again. A blood, you have anti-B, so you can only get A blood. O blood has no surface antigens, and you don't really need to know a lot about this, but this is what determines what blood a person can and cannot receive, and this is why we do a procedure uh, in the hospital uh, called type and cross-matching, to where you're trying to figure out their blood type and cross-match it to, with a uh, like a, an appropriate donor, okay? So there's A blood, there's AB blood, there's AB blood, and then there's O blood. And then we have this thing called rhesus factor. So you might have heard someone say, well, I'm A positive or I'm A pos. Well, that means they have A blood plus they have rhesus factor, okay? And this rhesus factor is another something, something that determines what blood you can and can't get. You don't need to know a lot about that, okay? Now, the circulatory system itself, the physiology, oh, we, um, we talked about this. You got to know the pulse points. I don't know if I've ever palpated a superficial temporal artery, which I guess you could. Um... You know, you could populate the, these aren't common. Let me show you which ones I want you to know that you should be able to palpate before you go to sleep tonight. The carotid arteries, the brachial arteries, the femoral arteries, the popliteal arteries, and the pedal artery. Those are the ones I want you to be able to palpate on both sides of your body. And if you have someone that's cool, do it to them with their consent. Make sure you know these. Now, um, blood pressure, which we, we've taught you how to do in class, is pressure of the blood that's exerted against the artery walls. And when we apply a cuff to someone's arm with a sphygmomometer, right, like a, a blood pressure cuff, we can measure based on the sounds that it produces. Um, I think it's the sounds of Wernicke. Maybe it sounds of Korsakoff. I don't remember. But anyways, it makes sounds. And that will produce, um, uh, it, it gives us a reading of blood pressure. Blood pressure becomes obviously, obviously, very clinically relevant. Uh, it dictates our treatment. I'll give you just a quick example. You can't give nitroglycerin if their blood pressure is like, depends where you work, less than 100. You can't give nitroglycerin, which is an EMT basic drug. So that's why we got to know these things. Okay. Um, let's see. So, so I, and we, we touched on this, the systemic vascular resistance. So the system's vascular resistance, it's kind of determined by how tight those smooth muscle within the uh, arteries and to a degree, the veins are squeezing down. Okay. So if they squeeze down really hard, the afterload is going to be really high because when the heart pumps, it's pumping through a little bitty water hose. So it has to pump really hard to get blood all the way up to your head and down to your big toe. So that, um, based on how tight these are squeezing down or not, will determine systemic vascular resistance, which plays a big role in blood pressure and afterload, and it consequently will affect preload and all these things. Now, again, uh, similar to... Uh, uh, your 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 the amount of uh, uh, your vital capacity in your lungs, right? Um, what the amount of air or blood in a human is about five liters. So this is a liter, right? You know, a little smart water bottle. I'm not rich. I just refill these. Um, so it's like five liters, okay? So um, the, you, we, our body has five of these, okay? And I teach this in the Stop the Bleed class because I think it's important for people to realize. I mean, it seems like a lot, but I mean, it's just five liters. That's all, like that's all the blood you got. Not necessarily all the blood sitting in your in your vasculature. So, normal circulation in the adult. So, this is an important phrase that you must must know. In fact, let me do this. Okay. So, perfusion is circulation of blood in an organ or tissue in adequate amounts. So perfusion is simply defined as how, um, what's the, is, is the tissue getting adequate amount of blood and nutrients? If it is, it's perfusing. And the act of that is called perfusion. So we ask ourselves, is the tissue getting the adequate amount of blood it needs and nutrients? If the answer is yes, it is perfusing. And that process is called perfusion. If it's not, it's not perfusing and it is not perfusion. Right, but it's, in fact, the word's not perfusion. You know what the word is? It's called shock. Shock is simply defined as the lack of perfusion. I'll say it again. Shock is simply defined as the lack of perfusion. It's so simple. 
Shock is simply defined as the lack of perfusion. So when our cells are getting what they need, it's called perfusion. When cells aren't getting what they need, we call it shock. Okay? Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I have to say. I got all excited about it. But students get lost in the sauce on this. It's pretty, you know, it's easy. All right, so we have scenarios where we may not get, where we may encounter inadequate circulation. Okay, in, in, in adults or really patients. But the, the reason this is differentiated into adults is because children compensate differently. Whole nother lecture. Okay, but let's just think adults. We're adults here. So um, the heart will automatically lower the blood pressure as patient starts to lose blood. So let's just say someone slit their wrist. That's an easy way to, thing to imagine. They're just shooting blood across the room. Okay, so automatically the heart's going to lower the blood pressure. Okay, to try to, cons to conserve, right? So the vessel itself will constrict to provide smaller bed for the reduced volume of blood to fill. Intuitive. This is all intuitive. Think to yourself, what would you want if you slice your wrist open, okay? The heart will pump more rapidly as it continues to lose blood. The heart will pump more rapidly to circulate the remaining amount of, of uh, blood efficiently. Here's where this becomes important. Remember the whole cardiac output formula? If systemic vascular resistance decreases... The only way to improve cardiac output is to increase heart rate. I'll draw this out for you. So cardiac output equals systemic vascular resistance um, times um, uh, heart rate. So if this goes down, the only way you can still keep this number constant is to increase that to get the same number, right? Simple arithmetic. So th that's why you see an increased heart rate, okay? The pulse increases as pressure falls. Again, the heart rate's going to go in. So a late finding in shock is tachycardia, especially hypovolemic shock. Tachycardia, tachycardia is a fast heart rate. Um, and if blood loss is too great, the patient will go into shock and then they'll end up dying if you don't correct it. Now, this is an important thing. So 30% of the blood is – so like 30% is an important number to understand for nitroglycerin. 30% of the blood is in the heart, arteries, and capillaries. So not a lot is actually sitting in your arteries, your heart, and your capillaries. The majority of your blood is sitting in veins and venules. So remember these Dollar Tree hoses I was talking about called the veins and venules. Real collapsible, but they also have what this thing called incredible capi uh, capacitance. They can swell up a bunch if you let them. They can hold a lot in them. Arteries cannot because the muscle layer is so thick, they can't swell up a lot. But veins and venules, by design, God himself said, let's just swell up these veins and venules, and that is where the majority of your blood is held. Test question, where is the majority of blood held within the vasculature? Answer, veins and venules at 70%. Gots to know that. Got to know it. We're almost done. Um, the two main uh, forces at work in the capillary are these two things called hydrostatic and oncotic pressure. So hydrostatic pressure is literally like, um, think hydro water. So it's like kind of like water pressure, okay? Water pressure, the amount of push, like blood pressure, push behind these uh, factors can kind of leak stuff out of the capillaries. So hydrostatic pressure, I want you to think water pressure. It's put like actual push of, of water pressure, right? Hydrostatic pressure, blood pressure, as opposed to... Oncotic pressure, this side of the house, that's based on proteins, okay? So oncotic pressure, um, it's proteins and salts and stuff, but it's more like um, protein is – it's, it's really actually it's proteins. It's not really uh, – osmotic pressure is more like the salts and stuff. But um, uh, uh, oncotic pressure is um, – uh, that's proteins. How much proteins are in there? Here's where this becomes clinically relevant. I, you don't have to memorize this for now, but you will eventually – have you ever seen Granny's feet, right? And they're all swollen, right? Like they're really swollen and look really big and they're holding lots of water. It's because she has heart failure probably or kidney disease. And what happens is um, there's increased hydrostatic pressure down there. So the fluid will leak out of the capillaries and you end up with a phenomenon known as pitting edema. And so next time you're at Granny's house, go pushing on her shin with your thumb, push on her sh uh, shin with her consent for like a couple seconds and let go. You're gonna notice it leaves a divot in her skin. That's because she has increased hydrostatic pressure, which consequently decreased her oncotic pressure, which causes pitting edema. 
consequently reverse the opposite increased oncotic pressure happens when um like lymphedema so you've probably seen and i'm not stereotyping here uh, a fat person that has really big legs and you're like how in the world does someone's legs get that big what you push on them and they're boing boing they're bouncy it's because there's pla or there's protein within that interstitial fluid so it bounces back okay this is getting way off we'll talk about this in heart disease but just know there's two factors that determine capillary um, stuff, forces. The main one's hydrostatic pressure, and, and a close second contender is oncotic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure, blood pressure, heart, water. Oncotic pressure, proteins. Proteins for show. Okay? Now, the lymph system, um, we've got to be getting, yeah, we're at the end. Two more slides. Hang with me. My mouth, I'm tired of talking. Uh, lymphatic system transport lymph by passive circulation. So the lymphatic system, it doesn't really directly rely on the heart to pump it. It kind of relies on like muscles and like intrinsic movement to move lymph stuff. And what is lymph, right? I guess I should start with that. Like lymph is like this plasma like stuff um, that's formed from the interstitial and extracellular fluid. Okay. And within lymph, we, ha we, we also tend within the lymph to have some type of uh, like not we well, do have white blood cells but you tend to have like um just think immune stuff immune stuff happens in the lymph okay and so the lymph will circulate in its own little system um and through these thin walled vessels and i think there yeah there's a picture and so lymph is kind of intermingled with arteries and capillaries and veins and stuff but it is its own little separate highway and it's not as robust, okay? And you've probably heard of a lymph node, right? This is an accumulation of lymph, okay? When you're sick, the doctor will go filling on your neck and on your groin and all sorts of places where lymph accumulates. Well, lymph accumulates here and here and here and up in your axilla, your armpit. So that becomes relevant, okay? And lymph, you should know, lymphatic vessels are present in all tissues except the central nervous system, bone marrow, cartilage, epidermis is your outer layer, most layer of skin, and the cornea, which is the lining of your eye, your outer eye. Um, so, you know, I guess I wouldn't, but you, I can see this popping up on an exam someday. Where is lymph tissue not located at? And you'd have to pick one of these, okay? So, um, lymphatic will, uh, vessels will only carry the extracellular fluid, interstitial fluid stuff, away from tissues so the lymph tissue the lymph uh, uh the lymphatic system doesn't carry it to it only carries away from important to know that that's it we're going to end on this um i appreciate y'all's attention this is a very overwhelming chapter i've said that like i think four times now it's the fourth video we have one more video after this and then we'll move on to the next chapter um so again i want to stress the importance of what i've said Pretty much everything I'm telling you is high yield, and if it isn't making sense, reach out to your instructor or find some good resources on YouTube. Shoot me an email. We'll help you any way we can because um, you don't just have to hear it from Hunter, right? It may help to hear this from some dude with an Australian accent that says it way better than me. That's great. So realize there's a lot of resources out there on the interweb that can help you um, master this material. So with that, have a good day, and I appreciate y'all's attention.